Okay, so last but not least, um, we have a quite different talk uh, from Federated Chespers and Digital Things scenarios, um, actually quantum cryptography, which is, um, well, for me, was always a quite fascinating topic and uh, always a bit nebulous and uh, found it quite interesting that uh, people actually tried to do it with on that, so I'm really looking forward to this. And Brandon uh, Douglas, I'm going to do our last talk of the session. Okay, um, uh, my name is uh, Doug Hoxson, and uh, my co-presenter here is uh, Ryan Engel. Uh, Ryan is actually, we're listing him as an MS, he just graduated with his MS degree, he's actually a PhD student now. And um, based on this project, there's other people on our research team, a few of these people actually are, have just graduated their PhD as well. So, um, But the talk today is Modeling Quantum Optical Components, Pulses, and Fiber Optic Channels Using Omnet++. Um, I can easily talk for way, way more than 25 minutes, so I'm like really trying to uh, squeeze it down in here. Um, we, we think it's kind of maybe an interesting application of using Omnet as a discrete event um, framework that we create our own abstractions for representing pulses and fiber channels and basically optical things. Um, why we're interested in this is because, uh, well, first off, I work at the Air Force Institute of Technology. That's in the, in the United States. That is a graduate research uh, institution and we primarily have masters and PhD students go through our program so at the very end we have a list of all our publications and dissertations and theses that's been as a result of some of this work so why are we interested in this um, there's a particular system out it's called a um, quantum key distribution system uh, I saw Alice and Bob on one of the previous slides so I was kind of curious about usually they're composed of an Alice and a Bob and what the system is designed to do is it has some kind of what we call a classical channel, or I'm sorry, a communication or a quantum channel that optical pulses are, are created and sent from an Alice to a Bob. And given a certain protocol, um, they can uh, create or grow a, a, a cryptographic key that can be used to feed bulk encrypt encryptors, or in the end, you could actually go to what they call one time pad kind of thing and encrypt messages that you would actually send across some kind of a classical communication channel. So this is this enters the world of, of crypto, crypto systems. Um, but what's interesting is that the word quantum up there, that usually either scares people like crazy, which it does to me too. Um, the only aspect that I'll say about the quantum part of it is it's uh, the way these systems work is from a, a theoretical perspective, uh, given certain protocols, if Alice, creates a single photon, just an actually, not, we're not talking like optical channels with fibers that have, you know, bazillions of photons in them. We're talking about a single photon and sends it across some kind of a quantum channel like a fiber optic or even free space. So there's actually satellite to ground stuff of interest in this area. Um, that single photon, if it's polarized in certain ways, it goes and it's going to be detected by Bob and given certain protocols, you can essentially assure that the key that you generate is something that is not known by anybody else, namely what they call an Eve. Because if Eve goes in and tries to detect that single photon and try to measure, say, the, the, the polarization of it, the very act in the world of quantum, the very act of measuring it changes it. And so that introduces errors, which in the end can actually be detected, and that's what makes the protocol very interesting. Um, the, uh, there's an actual, okay, so this one here. The, uh, at a high level, it kind of looks like this. I've got this Alice that's taking and creating photons, um, polarizing in certain states, certain what's called bases, transmitting across some kind of a quantum channel, and on the Bob side, they go through some optical components to try to take those photons and decipher how are they polarized, and then given them how they, the Bob thinks they're polarized, they have a sort of a protocol, I'm not going to go into all this, but they have a protocol that they talk to each other and explain then um, how to reconcile a given key. And if, uh, if things work uh, correctly and there are so certain error thresholds about errors that are introduced to, to various non-idealities, non, non then you can essentially assure that there has been no Eve in the system that's, that's actually plugged themselves into here and detected and actually knows that key. Now, the, the thing about it is that's, that's the, law, the, the laws of quantum mechanics are the thing that sort of makes this protocol work and it, it makes it interesting. Um, what's unique about it is really is the fact that you can actually detect an eavesdropper. That's why it's a high interest. Um, but the whole protocol, the whole theoretical foundation of all this stuff in, in the world of security 
is the fact that it assumes certain um, idealities um, exist. In other words, one, that I, one, one assumption is that Alice can create uh, an optical pulse that has one photon. Well, that's not actually possible. It's, you can get close, you can build systems that take lasers and attenuate them way down and get something that has maybe no photons or one or, or probabilistically two or three or four and you can do more of a probabilistic thing, but you can't necessarily just generate one. And there are other issues that come back on the side of the detection. <coughs> you don't have detectors that necessarily just can detect a single photon. Typically, they detect, they have false detections. They have, they can detect one photon. They might detect multiple photons. And the better, higher quality ones tend to get more and more expensive. Um, so there are certain basic things when the systems are built to be practical they make certain assumptions in order to make them somewhat cost effective. Uh, cost effective is a really general term here. But to make them somewhat cost effective, they use components that are not like the most expensive and that can be out there. So uh, basically the systems are of interest. There's a lot of work, a lot of published work in the, air, in the world of physics in this. And what we're interested in doing is say, take and try to model these systems, uh, generate results that would match up with some published results but through the fact that we've done simulation, we a lot of times can expand the scope of our, the ranges of things that may not be published because we can vary things. So we've used the result published in a uh, you know, published paper to say, here's a data point from somebody that did something, say, in Tokyo. And we would mimic the system and build the system up with Omnet using components and hierarchical descriptions of things. And then we try to say, let's see if we can get to that point that they had published. If we get to that point they have published, we have some sort of validity that our, our, rep our system representation is matching well with the real world. And then we can expand upon that around those data points. And then we tend to publish more in that area to expand the range of things. So um, at a high level, this is kind of just a different picture of it all, but basically at a high level, we've got an Alice and a Bob system that talk through channels. Omnet matches the same idea with Omnet. The Omnet has channels. Um, it, the actual, each of the boxes, are, can be um, created uh, or uh, represented within Ahmed as essentially a hierarchy of, of modules. Um, uh, the, the talk mainly is focused a lot on the optical side of things, but there is also the basic processing that goes on, like just the plain old mechanics of doing different processes and calculations and stuff. But I'm gonna look more at the optical side of all this, but there is a whole other layer of, of, of things with uh, how do you process the information itself. Um, so, in the Omnet world, uh, this is the way you sort of build together a network from a hierarchical, oh, I keep jumping forward here. My, my thumb needs to be slightly smaller. I'm smacking it. Uh, so in the Omnet world, I basically have this organization. At the top level, I have a network that's composed of a bunch of modules and sub-modules and sub-modules and sub-modules. And it looks like this. I can take compound modules, build those up out of simple modules that are interconnected through gates and have some kind of high-level interface. So I've got basically a simple module that has a behavior. I've got my gates that are attached to my simple modules. I've got channels that are connected between those simple modules. And I've got messages that can flow between gates. Um, so that's how it looks kind of in the Omnic framework. And what we've done is I've taken the same basic concepts, but our modules might represent lasers that have the gates represent essentially optical ports. So if I actually bought like a laser, it has an, out, it has a, has a, an output for, for where your uh, pulse would go. That would be an optical port. Um, the messages are represented by actual optical um, pulses. And those pulses can represent, we have a variety of pulse types that we can represent. Um, and we essentially can assemble at a high level, assemble a complete system using a, a whole toolbox of these simple modules that have been defined. Um, and so at the highest level, we actually put together like the whole, we call it QKD system, the whole entire thing. Oh, well, the, so the channels here too, the channels, um, we wanted to mimic the concept of a fiber channel or even a free space channel. So we've taken the channel concept and, and tailored it to the domain of optical systems using Omnet. So here's just an example. Um, like I said, I can't, my Alice can't actually create single photons reliably, just a single photon and that's it. So what I actually do to make, a, to make something close to a single photon is I take a, a laser that actually has millions and bazillions of photons and I go through a series of, of, of components and I 
um, drop it down, so I attenuate it down to a pulse where I get mostly things coming out of here that mostly have one photon, or actually a whole bunch of pulses that have no photons, believe it or not, and then you have some that have one, and then very, very few have two, and less frequently you have three. Um, you can imagine that the, the throughput of these systems are, are just horrible, because you have a lot of stuff that has nothing. In order to, be, in order to get to the being guaranteed to be secure, you gotta go, you gotta have throughput that are actually tend to be kind of poor. So we have our components. Um, the PM is a, a polariz polarization maintaining fiber, so this fiber has certain characteristics. And we, we can assemble things like this. They call this a classical pulse generator, which creates a pulse. Um, we put together a whole bunch of different components in the framework. Um, using this, we have um, a lot of these components here have a lot of uh, fundamental features that are available. Um, whether or not the, uh, the components are active or a passive kind of device. Um, uh, the components, a lot, a lot of these components have optical ports on them. So um, you might have, say, an attenuator that has a port where a pulse would enter the, the attenuator and exit the attenuator. But in the real world, depending upon what you want to model, the real world is a pulse hits the attenuator, the face of that attenuator, and actually, and if you want to get down to as much detail, there's actually a reflection that gets bounced back off of it as well. So part of it goes through, and part of it gets reflected. So we, get, we have the ability to add in the capability of having reflections. Um, that lends itself to interesting problems, by the way, so. Time here, okay, so. The way we organize things is the simple modules, we basically use the Omnet um, simple modules as representing the temporal behavior of the components of interest, and I would also say the data flow. So it handles the flow of where pulses go and the temporal characteristics. All the transformations within the components, like I've got a pulse that went through an attenuator and it was attenuated by this many dB, therefore the output pulse should look, look like this. We kept those more just a bunch of a whole bunch of a whole bunch of functions that are written in C++. Just a whole bunch of just plain old functions, so that the simple modules essentially call out to the function and say, "Tell me, I, hey, I'm an attenuator. Tell me what the attenuation is going through this device." Um, we put in some uh, capabilities for component aging, um, some failure modes, like if uh, devices act differently if they've been damaged uh, or degraded. So we have kind of a couple different modes for those. So if I have an attenuator that was hit with a very high energy pulse, it actually goes it can go into a state where it's somewhat damaged. It'll work, but it doesn't work the same way. And at some point, if it's completely damaged, um, it will basically cease to work. So those are the kind of things there. So organizationally, we have it like this. Um, on that tier, on this providing a, the fundamental foundation for all of the screen event simulation capabilities. Um, the package of stuff that we put together on top of this, we, we refer to it as QKDX, QKD, and X was just, I just made it up one day, but we call it now experimental in the paper. It's just a, it was actually, it's like a meeting now, but it was all made up at the time. It was just put an X on there. It sounded cool. Um, so we have different packages here. We have different packages that deal with um, just the mathematics of transformations. We have actual um, components that are basically subclassed off of a lot of simple modules. Uh, we have fiber channels, so we have channel abstractions that um, are particular to fiber. Um, and then we had some test cases here, a lot less, actually some of that stuff's kind of gone now, but um, we had a lot of test cases to test out these things. Some of the test stuff is actually flowing up here. But from this basic um, organization then, we build different kinds of simulation applications that are used for studying certain problems. And a lot of these, in particular, like Ryan, we would build to get, put together a particular simulation application that represented a particular QKD system that he uses as a study for his, his master's thesis. And then he hopefully generates a lot of data, publishes some stuff, and all that's, you know, all goodness. So, um, so and the pulse. Uh, here's the way the pulse stuff works. We took the Omnet message, subclassed it, and created our own message class, our own pulse message class, as opposed to using the, the automated um, message compiler. The reason being is we need to manage a pointer ourselves. We actually need to manage a pointer and we have our pulses are our separate class, um, separate hierarchy. Um, they have associated with, they have various polarizations. Pulses can actually have shapes information. Um, the way these simulations work is they're actually very prob probabilistic. So we associate an actual shape to the pulse, which 
when it gets clear to the end and the detector detects it, it detects these, these various pulses. It kind of keeps a queue of pulses that arrive within a certain window of time, and then it does an integration over all these different shapes to figure out whether or not, in fact, it should click, whether or not it detected something. So we need to keep all the shape information along with the pulses. And this one called ID300 is just one that's, that's uh, uh, well-defined from a, um, an actual commercial system. Uh, ID Quantique is uh, the company. Um, and they're actually south of here, right? So yeah, they're, they're south of here in Switzerland. Um, but the main point of our own message class here is to manage, really is to manage this pointer. So the messages essentially carry around a pointer to the pulse, and there's a little reference counting system involved in this pointer, which is why I need to sort of intelligently uh, ref and unref pulses as we move into the system. <coughs> my detectors and basically say, hey, I want to keep a reference to this pulse. My message says I'm going away. I don't, I'm not needed anymore. And, and everything intelligently works, so I don't delete, delete away uh, instances that I don't want. Um, on the component side, um, like I said pretty much all of our um, mathematical calculations that have to happen in, in each component to make transformations, those are all just a bunch of, just a bunch of functions. There's nothing fancy, just a bunch of functions. But the state of um, the, the information that those, those functions need that describes the various characteristics of the devices actually created kind of a, a, a set of property classes that are all related into a hierarchy that relate. So I, for a bandpass filter, this class has a bunch of information about what bandpass filters are. I mean, what kinds of attributes are needed to describe a bandpass filter. And the simple module then keeps an instance of this class, calls the function, passes it off to, the, to that function, says here's your properties, go calculate something, it passes it to pulse as well, calculate some output, and then I will, man I will intelligently route it to the right gates of what should happen because I am a bandpass filter and I have an input gate and an output gate. So um, to be honest, this, this here, is, I actually don't like this that much, this, I don't like that either. Um, I don't like um, this too much. This actually starts looking a lot like a, just a database. I could just say, well, I just have a database of components, which literally is derived from spec sheets that are from companies that, that, that sell these components. Um, so like, uh, like you see in INET, um, the simple module, a lot of our actual components are um, a combination of a simple module, which is providing kind of a structural inheritance kind of capability, combined with some kind of interface for what, like what a detector is. And then we actually create real detectors out of this. And we keep these mostly abstract. There's maybe sometimes a little bit of information in them, like the ability that what detectors have the ability to, to emit signals to say they've been clicked. So there's different kinds of detectors. There's what they call single photon detectors that detect photons. There's also what they call classical detectors that detect just optical pulses in general, not really, don't have the resolution of any particular uh, photons. On the fiber channel side, um, we have had to tailor the actual channel class and on that to have our own fiber channel class. Um, the reason we do that is because fibers, um, fibers do weird things to, mes to messages or, or pulses. Um, they can attenuate. They can do other little, play little games like as the pulse is traversing through the fiber, the polarization may actually sort of drift through the, to the fiber. So we need to kind of have a class that could intelligently go in to the fiber, uh, the pulse, Move, moving through the fiber and say, I need to like actually alter your characteristics because of the fact you traverse the fiber. Um, literally, there are fibers that are buried um, in the ground. Some of them are suspended. Um, we actually did a study where, uh, I believe, I think it was in Tokyo, where they had, they had a QKD system where the fiber link was hanging from telephone poles. And it would sway in the wind. And depending upon how hard the wind was, it messed around with the polarization of the, of the pulse going through it, which messes up the QKD systems, so they had outages. We were actually able to simulate those whole scenarios and match really closely to what is published. So, um, so, so we had to include all those effects in, so we had to subclass off that. Now, well, the other thing is the fiber channel, uh, optical components, if you turn on sort of all the fidelity, all the detail that you want, you can have these reflections. So I could hit an a, a attenuator, and it would say, okay, I'm gonna pass this pulse through the attenuator, and oh, by the way, a reflection happened. 
but the reflection power-wise drops a lot of their energy and the pulse drops. And it can go back and it can hit, say, the front of the laser and it says, okay, I'm gonna reflect you back. And then I'm gonna reflect you back. And next thing you know, you got this thing, you got a couple modules in Omnet that have pulse, the messages just bouncing around that have almost no power. They have something. So they'll bounce around. So the fiber channel, basically, we add some capability. Say, hey, once you get to a, bolt, a certain energy threshold, just delete it, go away, because it's it's meaningless to what we're what we're very often studying. So um, testing wise, uh, running out of time. So testing wise, uh, I said we kept the mathematics um, and, and basically a bunch of functions. Um, we looked at the uh, data flow and. Whenever we had something that was concerned about focusing on how the, the flow of, of pulses moved through the system or the timing of those pulses, we would actually build Omnet test cases using Omnet and basically building special Omnet programs that do nothing but basically test outer components to make sure that they, make, they flow right, the timing looks right. But if we want to just purely test mathematics, it's not really about data flow and timing, just mathematics. We would take that and we use the, the SWIG package and we essentially wrote wrapper classes so we can bring things into Python. And Python just made it like really easy to go through and run like a million points and just plot something and just say, here's the result of a bandpass filter. And it was just very easy to sort of combine the testing capabilities of Python with Omnit for the right kinds of tests. Um, like I said, we built uh, a bunch of things. Um, the first chart I showed you was one early in the project. This chart has grown. We have more and more stuff that keeps getting built. And I'm um, gonna we'll let uh, Ryan here mention a couple of these. Um, these are for just particular QKD systems that are available. That are, some are real, some are like hypothesized, some are like have you know, possibly could be built and all that, so go ahead, Ryan. All right, so I'm gonna talk about three example simulation models that we have created uh, using this QTDX framework. The first two we have built, tested, and produced results with. The third is representative of our ongoing and future work. Uh, first one, you've seen a chunk of this already, uh, Dr. Hudson pointed out, the classic pulse generator. Um, once we had all of the components and the channels built, we were able to, able to assemble them into larger subsystem and system components. So what you're looking at here is the quantum module inside of ALICE. Uh, we expanded out the, uh, the classic pulse generator and a tiny pulse generator, and the quantum module in Bob with the few, with his uh, polarization uh, decoder expanded and his timing analyzer uh, expanded, which illustrates or highlights the detectors inside of his system. Uh, initially, we built these systems using the handle message paradigm, but we found that under certain circumstances, it was more efficient uh, easier to read and easier to maintain if we implemented some of the behaviors through the activity paradigm. Uh, our first study, uh, Dr. Hudson mentioned, was a uh, was to study behavior of polarization drift in uh, suspended or aerial fiber. Uh, we've abstracted the we've extracted Alice and Bob uh, just to high level components, and what what you do see are the measurements of the polarization drift itself. Uh, the rate of change, or polarization rate of change inside of the polarization correction controller in, in Bob, and then we see the resulting error rates, and we see where this error rate exceeds the threshold that it does in fact induce a system outage. So again, we were able to match uh, uh, experimental results. Uh, as our experience grew, we were able to produce a, another system that involved a decoy state enabled to QKD. Those systems are designed to be able to uh, defend against a, as of now, theoretical attack by Eve, where she siphons off some of those photons from the multi-photon pulses um, and is able to gain shared key information without inducing system errors, which are uh, fundamental to the nature of the QKD system. Uh, we ended up with uh, what we believe are the first results of a simulated PNS attack inside of a decoy state system what you're looking at here are the green and black data points illustrate the baseline behavior of a system where they're uh, tightly coupled between the signal, the normal, and the decoy states. And then the red and blue illustrate the uh, results of photon number splitting attack. And you can clearly see that there is uh, statistically and visually a difference between the, the two um, system results. Uh, the last example 
is illustrative, as I said, of ongoing in our future work. Uh, the detectors have some inherent uh, vulnerabilities, and other researchers have, up, have come up with a, another protocol to distribute uh, key material using Alice, Bob, and a third party, Charles, who performs a bell state measurement uh, using a, a portion of an entangled photon pair. Uh, we are in the process of modeling that system, in particular the bell state analyzer. Uh, what you see here is an abstraction of the Alice and Bob components connected to this Bell, Bell State Analyzer. Uh, in order to produce this model, we have had to enhance our laser mod models uh, to include timing information as well as ability to do some uh, polarization encoding in them instead of having that as a separate module. Um, so we're, we're still working on building that model. Uh, this is a list of our publications. We have nearly two dozen uh, journal articles and uh, masters or uh, theses and dissertations uh, written on the subject. Many of these are were directly supported by Omni. It brings me, I, I think, right to the dot. Uh, are there any questions? First of all, let's give a big hand to Ryan. So uh, it's a bit long presentation because they actually there were two papers and uh, it forced them to uh, put everything together into one. But I think, uh, as you can see from the amount of workload that was done for this, the amount of knowledge that's behind it, I think it's, it's a bit like the INET of quantum integrity systems that we have here. And it's, it's very big and very interesting. So maybe one or two quick questions. Comments or people? Oh. Yeah. Um, so if if you know, wanted to, to play with that, I, is this uh, available or no, uh, yeah, it being funded? We can, pub we can, we've been allowed to publish, well, have, it's real important for me, I'm a faculty professor, we will publish like pretty much anything we do, but when you get in the area of crypto, that's where if they get yeah, real, real funding with it. So believe it or not, in the presentation, in the paper, I, I, I'm like, I'm spelling out all the magic, you know, but that's okay, but the software right now, they're just very concerned about it because it, it falls into the crypto domain and, you know, governments have issues with what can be out there completely, so. Uh, that's, that's really interesting. But yeah, I'm very, very impressed. There's a really interesting usage of, of, of all that uh, kind of tying in uh, a lot of you know, very sophisticated math and, and, and physics to build a you know, system level. It reminds me a bit of last year when Leventa had the talk about the redesign of the physical layer, where for the first time, uh, apart from those specific frameworks like Mixum, real physical knowledge was introduced into modeling here and making our making simulation more accurate. So, and I think everybody could see that uh, there was a big amount of physical knowledge behind everything. So, but I also like those parts where uh, you highlighted the. The side, the small side stories, uh, how to make uh, life easier, like the testing tools, yeah. uh, do the mathematical tests over a uh, sweet pipe and integration, stuff like that. So, um, uh, yeah, there's been an evolution of, I would say, just plain old software in over a couple of years, and that, say, the first, I would say, big component was the thing called beam splitter. Mm -hmm. There's four ports on a beam splitter, and there's just kind of like a lot of things that happen in a beam splitter. And the initial code base for that, for one, it was coded as a, a simple module. And this thing was like 4,000 lines long. And it was to the point where I, when I inherited it, I was like, I can't read this. I mean, I just cannot. So we started looking at it more from the standpoint of, and, and, oh, and then the test case to test the beam split was like 30 test cases. Again, another big simple module was wired back to the beam splitter, trying to keep track of the timing. And, and I was like, I can't read this either. Um, so basically, we started looking at it and said, what does simple module provide? It was, I said, well, it provides data flow and, and timing. That's at the core of discrete event simulation. That is what you're providing. So let's lift at least all of the, the calculations for how to calculate how a pulse gets attenuated. At least package those up and get them out of simple module. So now at least we sort of, you know, code sort of kept sort of collapsing to more understandable pieces. Um, and so, you know, step by step, we try to leverage the leverage on that, um, you know, in the right way where we can test things with and without on that, depending upon what facet we're trying to actually test. So I think that that's, there's a lot of 
sort of lessons learned in some of that. Yeah. Actually, I've gotten more and more, adopting more and more functional programming styles for some of that. So. Yeah, so you, do you have a, a classic channel model that you're using as part of the part of? Oh, so the classical channel, yeah, so that's good. So, so the classical channel, we've never had anything where we had a significant requirement to model it in, in great detail. So our classical channel is, is really dumb. I mean, it's just delay, you know. Oh, okay. but, but it's like the opportunity was sitting there to say, this is where INET could sit. Mm -hmm. And basically, uh, so, so our next step here is there's interest in um, space to ground QKD systems where essentially a satellite emits a, this is unbelievable actually, I think. A satellite emits a single photon and is detected on the ground and these systems are systems that, uh, I don't know, the throughput's probably terrible, but they are considered, you know, it's possible they could work to detect a single photon from a satellite to the ground. So there's an interest in basic orbit models. I need geometry now. I need, I need Alice Bob need to be at a position. So um, I've been trying to participate on the forums with, uh, you know, some of the orbit models that's in the OS3 package and actually going to do some work on those, and, and uh, it'd be nice if something like that potentially could be an offering to like INET to say INET has a basic idea of propagating satellites. Um, uh, so that's one area where um, you know something to be added, and then the, the, the class the communication channel across free space and more free space models maybe, where you have the Earth's atmosphere modeled at some number of layers. And you're trying to capture some sort of, I would consider kind of high level model without having to get some humongous system that you're connected to to calculate what's my, my attenuation going through the atmosphere from this point in space. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question. But INET naturally fits right there, right in the classical channel. Perfect spot for it. Okay, let's give a big thanks to the speaker. We uh, strengthen your appetite for questions and for food. So we're going to continue with the lunch now and uh, at a couple of minutes before 1 p.m. I'm going to collect everyone back together. Yeah.